Our scripture lesson today comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I'll be reading from the fourth chapter, verses 20 through, 22 through 26 and 29 through 32. Listen now for the word of God for you. Paul says, you were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you are marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Let us pray. Dear God, in the midst of the confusion and the clutter and the chaos that surrounds our lives, help us to hear your voice, to feel your presence near to us today. Slow us down, if only for a little while. Draw us up onto your lap. Hold us close, even as you whisper to us those wonderful words that lead to life. Speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. Amen. Well, all I really wanted to do was sit and think. Was that too much to ask, Lord? It was an early evening flight 23 years ago, early autumn, 1997. I was flying to Orlando to see my dad after he had suffered his first major stroke. I was on the Charlotte to Orlando portion of the trip at dusk, hoping to just sit back and check out a gorgeous sunset and collect my thoughts but as so often happens, God had other plans. My seatmate on that leg of the journey was a good old boy wearing a cowboy hat with a snakeskin band, two rattlesnake rattles mounted in front. He was beyond three sheets to the wind, more like six sheets, plus the airplane bottles that were in front of him. And I surmised that I wasn't going to be able to dodge this bullet for very long. And I was right. Somewhere over the low country of South Carolina, he turned and he said, actually very loudly, hey there, bearded buddy. Anybody ever tell you you look just like Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers? We were off to the races. Yeah, they do, I said. And did you know that one of his hits was on my own, which is what I was hoping I would be on this flight. I actually didn't say that, but it would have been a great response. Soon thereafter, he asked what I did, which is always my moment of truth. For the record, so you know, I don't usually tell folks what I do until after I get to know them, because it's a conversation killer. People cease to be real. They say one of three things. I don't usually cuss this much, I don't usually drink this much, or I went to vacation Bible school when I was a kid. Well, I'm a Methodist minister, I said, and my boisterous new friend got quickly quiet. Can I ask you a favor, he said? Sure. 
I replied. And this is the story he told. I'm headed to Orlando to try and see my best friend from childhood, he said. We were inseparable growing up. We had a horrible argument the week after graduation. And I told him to go to hell. Time passed, but as I got over my anger, my pride got in the way. I never called him, he never called me. We were two stubborn mules who thought the other one was in the wrong. I moved to North Carolina right after that. Now it's been seven years since we talked. But you going to see him now, that's a good thing, isn't it? Sounds like a breakthrough to me, I said. That's just it, he said. His mother called me, told me he was in a really bad accident. They don't expect him to live. She asked me if I could come down as soon as possible. I gotta get there, preacher. He said through his tears, but what if I don't? Please say a prayer that I get there in time. And as the orange sky turned to black, we held hands somewhere over Jacksonville, praying for the gift of time. I got to get there, preacher. But what if I don't? What if? What if? Researchers have found that the single most expressed emotion in daily conversation is love. But the second most commonly expressed emotion is regret. What if? Everybody in this room knows about regret. Regret is a woman dying of emphysema who looks back on that first cigarette and think, if only I had known then what I know now. Regret is a man who lost his family because of alcoholism, looking back on his first drink and thinking simply, why? Regret is when a couple sitting in divorce court catch a glimpse of each other as they sit at their respective tables and they find themselves thinking back to their wedding vows and wondering, how did we end up in here? I know we don't like looking at the subject of regret because it's painful. But here's why we're doing that for just a second. The capacity for regret is a gift from God because it means we can learn. So just let God speak to you a moment this morning. Where might you be headed for regret if your life doesn't change? It's amazing to me how often I'll talk with men, especially as they get older, and they'll say something to me like this in my office. You know, when my kids were growing up, I was so busy, I was so consumed by my work, I traveled so much, now I would give anything to have those years over. But it's too late. Maybe it's your financial life. Maybe there's unnecessary debt or there's foolish spending. One day when you get to the end of your life, you're going to look back on it and say, why did I place such value on my stuff? What was the deal with money and security and possessions and image? Maybe you've been avoiding a hard, hard conversation with somebody. Maybe God is telling you right now, if you get to the end of your life without having that conversation, there is going to be a pile of regret. Maybe there's a confession, just a load of guilt or garbage, whatever it is on your heart, and you know it's time to clean it up. If you are on a train headed for a station called regret, get off that train this morning. Don't assign yourself to a lifetime of what ifs. You know, over these last four weeks, we've talked about what the transformed life in Christ looks like. Learning to see through the eyes of God, 
learning to pray sentence prayers and then listen for the answer, learning to change the way you think by marinating your mind. And today, we traverse the terrain where most of us struggle, how we use our words and how we use our time, which is why the Apostle Paul gets down to business with us in Ephesians chapter 4. Put away your former way of life, your old self. Clothe yourselves in a new way of life. Let no evil talk come out of your mouth, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words will give grace to those who hear. You ever wonder how much your word count would drop daily if you only spoke what is useful for building up and giving grace? And then the Apostle Paul hammers on your usage of time. Don't spend your life and your moments being bitter or angry. Quit wrangling and talking bad about people. Find ways today to be kind to one another, to be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. One of my favorite authors, Ken Davis, says the most dangerous word in the English language is the word tomorrow. I'll get to it tomorrow. I'll sit down. I'm going to talk with my spouse about that important stuff tomorrow. I'll check in with the kids tomorrow. I'm going to get serious about my diet, my relationships, my faith tomorrow. And as the songwriter so sagely reminds us, tomorrow never comes. Each day you and I get 1,000 440 minutes. And on average, you and I speak 16,000 words per day. But the real question is this. How are we managing those minutes? How are we managing our mouths? Are we seizing the gift of time that has been given to us? Or are we trifling it away? Are we speaking words that really matter? It was January 7th, 2014, close to 11 o'clock in the morning, when I said goodbye to our youngest son, Robbie, at the BP gas station just off of Wrightsville Beach, having sufficiently gassed up his tank before his return to Knoxville for semester number two at the University of Tennessee. As we hugged goodbye, he said, Pop, I love you. Make sure you check out my room when you get home. In the moment, I'm a little bit bewildered, thinking that he's left a pile of laundry, <laughs> some mess for me to clean up. But I say, of course, buddy, I'll check it out soon. And I love you, too. When I get home, I head to his room, and on his door, there is a sheet of paper that reads, if you characterize people by their actions, you will never be fooled by their words. Will you fool me? When I go inside, I'm blown away. 28 pieces of paper taped to the wall. Ten of them are tombstones with these words. Here lies Robert Jeffrey Bauman, 1961-2016, a great man who died too early. And here's what the paper said. Dear Dad, I am sincerely appreciative of the hard work and the love you have given me. I couldn't ask for a better father. You are always calm, quick to listen, slow to speak. You always try to be a peacekeeper and put out whatever fire started from one of the family members. You always do the right thing. On a scale of one to 10, you would get a 10. I can always go to you for advice, but lately I've been wondering how much longer I'll be able to have that opportunity. Your blood pressure is the absolute worst it could be, 
And although you've dodged the bullet for several years, it's only a matter of time until it catches up to you. If you don't change this, a stroke or a heart attack is inevitable in the next decade with the stress of your job. There are oh so many things you will miss in life if you don't change this. Kristen Wyndham is your daughter. She's your little princess. She's your first child you saw graduate, the first one to marry. Will her ch children only know you through stories and pictures? Andrew Bauman is your oldest son. He's going to be a famous author. Will you be here to read his books and help him navigate his path? Robbie Bauman is your awesome son of 19 years. Are you going to be here to cheer him on? Or will he be left scrambling for answers, wondering what to do? He closed with these words, Dad, you have two options. Get healthy, change your diet, live to see Kristen and Jason's kids, read Andrew's bestsellers, listen to me preach, or eat anything you want, don't exercise, pass away early, leave your children with no advice, leave us to have Christmas after Christmas without you leaving grandchildren who wish they had met you, and countless church members and friends wishing you were still here. Time is a gift, Dad, but are you going to be here to spend time with us? Words are important, Dad. Are you going to be here to speak them to us? The choice is yours. Speak what is useful for building up, Paul says. Robbie needed to speak those words. I needed to hear those words. So where does that need to happen in your life? Teach us to number our days, O oh God, that we might be wise in our investment of time and in our speaking of words, says the psalmist in Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to have the conversations we need to have with you, with others. I thought about the psalmist's prayer as I heard one of my hauntingly favorite songs on the radio this week. I'm guessing you remember the words. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. He was talking before I knew it, and as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, you know, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And as he walked away, he smiled and he said, you know, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. The final verse reads like this. I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle. The kids have the flu. But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. The cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you coming home, Dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. 
Maybe you've heard the song, but here is the rest of the story. Harry Chapin's wife, Sandy, actually wrote the words to that song after their son, Josh, was born. Her inspiration for that came from the relationship between her first husband and his father. Sandy's first husband, James, was the only child of John Cashmore, the longtime president of the borough of Brooklyn, New York. John was a very interesting man. He was one of 11 children. He never went past the fifth grade in school. He started an office furniture company, built an incredibly successful business. John wanted his son to be a judge. He was trying to engineer the kind of career for his son that he didn't have for himself because of his lack of education. When James went away to college, his dad gave him a membership to the country club, a new car, plenty of credit cards. All those things made James feel like his life was a fix, Sandy said. By the time I met him, even though he was intelligent and accomplished at so many things, he had no sense of himself. James and his dad grew up in the same house, but they never communicated with each other. After she and James divorced, Sandy reflected on what she'd seen. It struck me in hindsight, she said, I realize that you have to be in communication with your children from the time they're born. And out of that moment, I wrote that poem. Harry came home one day and I showed him the words. And he just sort of brushed them aside, she said. But about a year later, after Josh was born, Harry picked up the poem again, and he put music to it. It became his most famous song, one of the greatest anthems of a generation. But it also became a self-fulfilling prophecy. When Josh was seven, Harry was performing 200 concerts a year. Sandy asked him when he was gonna take some time to be with his son. Harry promised to make some time at the end of the summer. On Thursday, July 16th, 1981, a truck hit Harry Chapin's Volkswagen on the Long Island Expressway. He was 38 years old. When you coming home, Dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. Who needs your time? Who needs to hear the words that only you can say? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.